ramping up. Our top diplomat arrives in Turkey as the U.S. moves closer to launching airstrikes against ISIS in Syria. His flock is in the heart of conflict. This Catholic patriarch meets one-on-one -on -one with our Jason Kelvin. Captured, the Taliban team suspected in the shooting of young activist Malala is now in custody. And papal wedding. We meet a couple who will be married by Pope Francis this Sunday. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, September 12th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. The hunt for Islamic militants is ramping up tonight. The U.S. has dozens of spy planes in the air over Syria looking for potential targets. Preparations are underway in case the military move to strike, but White House officials repeated today that potential airstrikes are just one part of a wider strategy to defeat ISIS. Wyatt Goolsby has more. As the U.S. monitors Syria from the air, Secretary of State John Kerry is on a different kind of campaign. He's convincing Middle Eastern nations to join a coalition against the militants in Iraq. It has asked for help from the United States. It has asked for help from its neighbors, from other countries in the region. Kerry visited both Saudi Arabia and Turkey today, part of a regional tour the White House says is critical. Uh, there is a strong commitment from these countries in the region uh, to working with the international community uh, to deny ISIL uh, the kind of safe haven that would pose a significant threat to countries in the region, uh, but also countries around the world. The president has picked retired Marine Corps General John Allen to lead the international effort against ISIS. A good pick, says Jim Phillips, a Middle East expert with the Heritage Foundation, but not without challenges. Those Arab countries don't really have very strong military power and they have fragile internal political situations. Phillips says the fight won't be easy. The CIA estimates between 20,000 and 30,000 fighters are on ISIS side, and the number of Westerners in their ranks, up to 2,000. Young, impressionable Muslims are brainwashed by recruiters to come to fulfill what they see as a duty of jihad, of holy war. Our Wyatt Goolsby, and it's ideology that a Pentagon official said needs to be destroyed. The White House says even with the threat from tens of thousands of ISIS fighters, the president is firm on the strategy that he laid out this week. Some of the other news our, our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A historic first, five Middle Eastern patriarchs meet President Barack Obama at the White House. Our Jason Calvi joins us to share his exclusive interview with one of those patriarchs. Jason. Bri Brian, the patriarchs were in town for the In Defense of Christians Summit. The visit to the White House came just one day after the president laid out his strategy for fighting ISIS. The meeting is all the more pressing as we see the Islamic State targeting Christians. We have a heavy, long way of cross, very tired, exhausted. That was the message Melkite Greek Catholic Patriarch Gregorius III gave to President Obama. At the White House Thursday, the patriarchs met first with the National Security Advisor, and then the president casually joined the meeting. He kept by him alone, just pushing the door without you know, His Excellency, no, just like that. It's good. He's American. <laughs> his beatitude lives in Damascus, Syria, and shared his firsthand experience with war and suffering. He says 91 churches there have been destroyed or damaged. Patriarch Gregorius says the president was receptive to his message. It was a, a kind of beautiful, peaceful, and I think it was an internal connection between the president and us. As a group, the patriarchs spoke with the president about their fears that ISIS could move into Lebanon, helping Iraqi refugees return home, and the situation in Syria. The patriarch says that after three years of conflict in Syria, a new approach is needed. Believe us, hear the voice of the church for once, and you will see you will bring peace for you and for us. And the patriarch wants a global consensus to fight ISIS, but says it's more than just a physical conflict. Because of this very dangerous group and state, but to fight for against this ideology. And he says we have to ask God, the Prince of Peace, to bring peace. Now the patriarch returns home to Syria 
after three days in the nation's capital. But Brian, he says he and the other patriarchs are going to continue to work together in the coming months. Thank you, Jason. And Pope Francis will visit Turkey at the end of November. That trip became official after the Holy See received an invitation from the Turkish president this morning. The trip will give Francis the chance to speak to the Muslim world in a country on the front lines of the Islamic militant surge. Confirmation of the papal trip comes as the U.S. pressures Turkey to secure its borders to prevent fighters and funding from flowing to ISIS. Pope Francis could canonize a 17th century priest as Sri Lanka's first Roman Catholic saint during his trip earlier th early this year, rather early next year. Francis plans to visit the island nation January 13th through the 15th and then travel on to the Philippines. The Archbishop of Colombo, Cardinal Malcolm Ranjit, said he hoped that the Vatican would give final approval before the visit. St. John Paul II beatified Father Joseph Vaz during his 1995 visit to Colombo. A Northern Ireland political leader who staunchly opposed working with Irish Catholics but ultimately made peace with them has now died. Ian Peasley, a Protestant, was one of the most polarizing leaders of the conflict in Northern Ireland. In his early years, he spurred clashes against Catholic civil rights marchers. In 1998, he denounced the Good Friday peace accords that helped end the troubles on the island. Finally, in 2007, Paisley changed course. He led the first stable coalition government of Protestants and Catholics for the territory. He was 88 years old. South African Olympian Oscar Pistorius is guilty of killing his girlfriend, but not guilty of murder. That's the ruling today by the judge presiding in his case. The judge says there wasn't enough evidence to prove Pistorius knew his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, was behind a bathroom door in their home when he shot and killed her. Pistorius claims he thought an intruder was in the house when he fired a gun through that door. Pistorius will be sentenced next month. He could go to prison for up to 15 years. Pakistan says it's captured a group of men responsible for attacking teenage activist Malala Yousafzai. The army says the 10 militants are from Yousafzai's hometown and took orders from the Pakistan Taliban. Yousafzai and the two friends were on their way from... Uh, they were on their way home from school in 2012 and were shot. She suffered serious gunshot wounds to the head and ultimately went to Britain for medical treatment. The army says Malala was targeted by the Taliban for advocating gender equality and education for women. Slain journalist Jim Foley's mother says she expected the U.S. government to do more to save her son. Foley was the American journalist beheaded by the terror group ISIS. In a CNN interview, Diane Foley says the family was in contact with the government about her son. She says the government warned it would be illegal for the family to pay the ransom demanded by the terrorists. And she says the government's efforts didn't go far enough. As an American, I was embarrassed and appalled. Um, I think our efforts to get Jim freed were an annoyance, you know. Um, and an annoyance I, to the government. Yes. And they... Yeah, and it wasn't, didn't seem to be in our strategic interest, if you will. Um, I was appalled as an American. Jim would have been saddened. Jim believed till the end that his country would come to their aid. Foley told CNN the government wasn't willing to negotiate or attempt a rescue of her son. The White House said previously that a mission to try to save Foley and others had failed. Jim Foley was working as a freelance journalist in Syria when he was captured in 2012. Members of Congress returned to Washington this week after their August break. Some were briefed about the president's plans to contain ISIS. Congress is expected to vote at some point on funding those administration plans. Beyond that, though, what will Congress accomplish in the coming weeks? Jason Grimay, the president and founder of the Bipartisan Policy Center, is joining us. Jason is the author of a new book, City of Rivals. It was released this week. I can't wait to read your book. With Congress returning to Capitol Hill and immigration reform pushed back after the election, what will Congress do this fall? Well, Brian, it's uh, nice to be here. I think the dominant dynamic for Congress over the next month or so is obviously the midterm elections. But there are two moments where they have some work to do. Over the next week, Congress has to pass a continuing resolution to keep the budget going. And the sense is they'll push forward to about a month after the election. They're also going to probably deal with this issue over the Export-Import Bank and also kind of kick the can, keep that authorized till June. They were pretty much ready to go and get out of town until the president uh, called on the Congress to engage with his plans for ISIS. And I think that's really the challenge for the next few days. I think the sense is they'll probably 
uh, address the question of providing some resources for training of troops. They're going to stay away from the war powers question of authorization of military force because that's a little too challenging before the election. So they'll avoid those hard decisions. You know, that has been the um, imagination of our uh, courageous Congress for the last several months, and I expect that'll certainly continue prior to the election. There has been nothing bipartisan about this Congress. However, with this military situation, with the attack or the, the uh, strategy against the Islamic State, do you expect to see the parties come together on this? Well, you know, I think there's always been this imagination that politics ends at the water's edge, that while we may you know, beat the heck out of each other here at home when we're engaging international crises, we act as one nation. And I think we're seeing some of that. There's certainly going to be bipartisan support, at least for the beginnings of this effort. You know, there's still quite a bit of squabbling about why we're into this challenge, but I think it provides some basis for that kind of collaborative conversation. I've heard some say this is the worst gridlock we've ever seen in Washington. How does it compare with situations in the past? So, you know, the, the 238 years of our democracy has not been political cohesion, tranquility, and abiding public trust. You know, we've had great and really terrible moments in the past. I think what is different now is that we're no longer able to kind of metabolize the partisanship. We used to be partisan and productive. You know, I mean, look back to the Clinton administration, politics of personal destruction, the Lewinsky scandal, impeachment, contract with America, but they still got things done. And I think that's the difference. And really a lot of what I focus on in the book is how to bring back that constructive partisanship. City of Rivals restoring the glorious mess of American democracy. Do you have solutions suggested in here? Yeah, I certainly have some solutions. I think the sense of this book is that we don't need a constitutional convention or attack from Mars to get the country working again. We need to improve the way we bring people to Washington, both with our elections, but then we also have to think about how we treat them when we get here. And one of the real ironies that I focus on a lot in this book is that a lot of the well-intentioned reforms have actually made it harder for Congress to act in the national interest. And I think we need to reconsider some of that imagination that we should have transparency around all things. President and founder of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Jason Grimay, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Coming up, FEMA wants repayment from some families who got help after Superstorm Sandy. And lava laps from the fissures of a volcano in Iceland, fueling fears of a major eruption. On Friday, September 12th, this is EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's been nearly two years since Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast, and now FEMA is demanding some people pay back their aid money. Katherine Zeltner reports. Gary Silberman lived with his dad in this New York home when Superstorm Sandy hit. He got $17,000 from FEMA for assistance, but now they say he's got to pay it back. It's, it's a horrible feeling. You know, I'm still recovering from the storm emotionally and financially. And to come back and say, we want all the money we, we gave you back. FEMA says Silberman was staying at his father's house, which is limited to one payout under $7,000. But Silberman says he was a tenant paying rent, so he's entitled to separate assistance. According to a search of public records by the Associated Press, FEMA is scrutinizing about 4,500 households. It suspects received improper payouts. In a statement, FEMA said, FEMA has worked diligently to put protections in place that safeguard against waste, fraud, and abuse, reduce the instance of improper payments, and maintain a fair and transparent process. It's not in anybody's interest for the federal government to seek repayment from someone who simply doesn't have the funds to repay it. Ann Dibble runs the Storm Response Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group, a nonprofit law firm that helps low-income people like Silberman. She's concerned more people could be hit with these repayment letters. So somebody who doesn't respond to a letter that they get from FEMA is going to be subject fairly quickly to having their wages garnished. They might have their Social Security garnished. Silberman says he spent the money and has nothing left to pay FEMA back. His first appeal was denied. Silberman now hopes FEMA will grant him a hearing so he can plead his case in person. Katherine Saltner, EWTN News Nightly. Baltimore Ravens fans showed support for former running back Ray Rice last night. The Ravens beat their division rival Pittsburgh Steelers 26-6 on NFL Thursday Night Football. Many condemn Rice's actions after seeing video that shows him punching and knocking out his then fiance, but some disagree about how the NFL should punish him. Fans were wearing Rice's number 27 jersey. They got a mix of boos and cheers last night. 
The video set off a national debate over domestic violence and the harm it does to women. To discuss this further, one of our regular contributors, Gloria Purvis, is with us. Gloria, what's your take on the way this case has been handled by the Ravens and by the NFL? I think they tried to do damage control by not releasing all the information, and that blew up in their face. And I think they need um, some help in understanding that this is a bigger problem than, than your prized running bag remaining a profitable entity for your organization. They had an opportunity to make a statement to their women, their female fans, and also the women who are married to the current NFL players and to the players themselves. And I think they failed in that regard. I want you to listen to a statement made by one of the female fans at the Ravens game last night. I believe that everybody deserves a second chance. This is a situation that is uh, between his wife and himself. They're going to counseling. She married him for a reason, and she's standing by her man. And I feel that everybody should uh, leave them alone and let them deal with the situation. Standing by her man, she, he deserves a second chance, does he? Well, I think he did get a second chance when she didn't die, when she hit her, uh, hit her head on that railing. Good point. And he has a chance now to work through counseling with his wife, and he has a young daughter. But does that mean the NFL and the Ravens owe him a job? Considering what they want in their players and the image that they want to project, I, I don't think so. Janae herself defended her husband on Instagram this week. Uh, is that healthy in this situation? She didn't acknowledge that he even did anything wrong. Well, when I saw her defense of him on Instagram, I thought, ah, typical battered woman behavior. I questioned the efficacy of their counseling because nowhere in there did she quite clearly name what he did is wrong. She blamed the media and everybody else for their nightmare when the blame should be on him and they need to look at their relationship. But it was typical um, to me, battered woman behavior and she could be acting out of fear in doing that as well. Well, marriages can survive something like this, but let's look at the Catholic teaching and the Catholic approach yes. to abuse within a marriage. Yeah, the U.S. Catholic bishops made a pastoral statement called When I Call for Help. And it talks about the three goals of if a, if a minister has, intervenes in this kind of relationship. The, in, the, in this order, the goals are uh, safety for the woman and the child, responsibility for the abuser, and thirdly, um, help restoration of the relationship if possible or mourning the loss of the relationship. But let's make it clear, acting to end the abuse in no way violates your marital promises. Very clear. Thank you, Gloria Purvis. You. We appreciate thanks. your contribution. Thanks. Well, a volcano that's been rumbling in Iceland is now threatening to blow its top. Check out this fissure eruption at Bardabunga Volcano. Thousands of small earthquakes have rocked this region, leading to concerns of a full-blown eruption. Dense ash clouds from the volcano recently disrupted air travel. This latest activity has produced a lot of lava, but not much ash. Up next, what a wedding. Pope Francis himself presides this Sunday for the matrimony of this couple and 19 others. And he's rarely seen in public, but we'll show you the latest picture of Pope Emeritus Benedict posted in an unlikely place. On Friday, the 12th of September, this is EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. When Catholic Church teaching crosses party lines, how do Catholics vote? Researchers at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the University of Notre Dame are studying the pressures that face Catholic voters. So far, they found that Catholics who follow church teaching are caught straddling the line between Republicans and Democrats. In presidential elections, that group deals with the conflict by choosing the party matching the voters' values on pro-life or social justice issues. The research also shows these Catholics justify their decision by assuming their candidate follows the church in all other issues. Laura Hussey recently presented this research at the American Political Science Association joining us now. So according to your research, how does Catholic Church teaching influence Catholic voters? We can't see it at its fullest because candidates that hold the types of policy views the Catholic bishops often articulate, pro-life views on, abu on abortion, pro-social welfare views on other issues, just aren't running for office. So we find that instead, Catholics are prioritizing one of these issues and voting accordingly. You focus on committed Catholics who agree with church teaching. Not all Catholics do, by the way, mm -hmm. especially on those two big political issues. That's right. Do they tend to vote Republican or Democrat? Pro-life, pro-welfare Catholics vote fairly solidly Democrat, and that happens regardless of levels of religiosity. We're talking about 76 percent of them voting fairly consistently for Democrats over the last several presidential elections. 
How is that? It might be somewhat surprising since is. religiosity is usually associated with Republican votes, especially among people who are pro-life. What we're seeing is that to most of these Catholics, social welfare issues are far more important than abortion issues, and Catholics are translating that into a Democratic vote. In addition, we found that a very large share of these Catholics believe, when asked to identify candidate positions, that the Democrat opposes most legal abortions, which is something that's not true when you look at what candidates actually say. What about the larger sampling of Catholics surveyed? What did you find about them? Do they have anything in common in the way they voted? Not a lot. We have some Catholics who might look more like stereotypical political liberals, very solidly Democratic in the way that they vote. Catholics who might look like stereotypical conservatives who are very solidly Republican in the way that they vote. And then we have some Catholics who take sort of centrist positions on these issues that fall somewhere in between. But pro-life, pro-social welfare Catholics look a lot more like liberals in the way that they end up voting in the end of the day. And they don't seem to have really agonized over this choice. So it seems to me then there is really no Catholic vote as such that campaign that candidates are going to target directly. There is no Catholic vote. Uh, among Catholics, we see the same kind of political diversity that we see among Americans generally in politics. Even if there were a Catholic vote, people whose politics might look like that of the bishops or the state Catholic conferences, we wouldn't be able to see it in action because those types of candidates just aren't running for office. Very interesting material. Laura Hussey, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time. Pope Francis celebrates a special mass this Sunday. He'll preside at the weddings of 20 couples. Our Alan Holdren has more from Rome. Alan? Brian, they're going to be married here in the Basilica of St. Peter's behind me. All of them Italian, all are from the Diocese of Rome. We talked to one of the couples about being married by Pope Francis. Italians Marco Percaro and Laura Capurso will be married by the Pope on Sunday. After requesting the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, they couldn't believe when they had been chosen. We didn't sleep for two days. But she didn't sleep for two weeks until the response. <laughs> This pope is known for his pastoral touch, much appreciated, especially during his weekly public audiences in St. Peter's Square. According to official Vatican statistics, 6.6 .6 million people saw Pope Francis in public and private audiences in 2013 alone. Encounters include more intimate events, like this mass in the Sistine Chapel earlier this year, where he baptized 32 children. Io te battezzo nel nome del Padre e del Figlio e dello Spirito Santo. He hasn't yet publicly married anyone as Pope. But this couple is happy he's decided to start. He's such an important person for me. That Francis will be marrying us is the greatest thing that could have happened. Married by Francis and to Marco. For them and 19 other couples, Sunday will be a day to remember. Brian, officials from the Diocese of Rome say that this is a way of, for the Pope to show his closeness to the people of Rome. From the moment he stepped out on the balcony in March of 2013, he said that he was the Bishop of the Diocese of Rome. He's showing that as he does in confirmations, first communions and baptisms here in the diocese throughout the year. This is a great opportunity for him to do it once again by marrying these couples. Brian? Yeah, and what a gift to those couples. Thank you, Alan. Well, public appearances are extremely rare for Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, but with social media, we have a new window into the life of our only former pontiff who is still living. Today, Benedict posed for his first and second selfies. Catholic News Service posted both pictures. They feature the Pope Emeritus with a priest and a seminarian in Rome. They appear to be having a good time, but Benedict looks rather frail. The former pope is living a life of prayer and study in a monastery in Vatican City. Let's keep him in our prayers. Really good to see Pope Benedict. Have a good weekend. Until Monday, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime you like on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and God bless.